Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to the last uh, coaching seminar of this semester and this year. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Omar Leo Sanchez from the University of Manchester. And he'll talk about a Poisson basis theorem for symmetric algebras. All right, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ronnie. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, so before I start, I, I wanna thank uh, as usual, the, the organizers of the seminar for inviting me and also for accommodating uh, my sort of a special request of moving the seminar from Thursday to Friday. I had, a, I had a Christmas concert to attend yesterday, so I couldn't make it. And so they were very kind and, uh, and were able to change the date. So thank you for that as well. Okay, so let's, let's go ahead uh, with the talk. Uh, and also thank you, by the way, to the other people that are attending the fields workshop. Thanks for, for showing up, at least for part of it. So the, the, the aim of the talk is to, to talk about, about this kind of uh, 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 Poisson version or Poisson basis theorem that is probably quite well known to everyone here, which is the analog somehow of a differential basis theorem. Okay, and uh, this is joint work with Sue Sierra from, from Edinburgh. So the goal uh, for the next uh, 38 minutes is to state uh, a basis theorem for Poisson algebras. Um, part of the tools that we had to develop for this basis theorem, it's not surprising, is some sort of elimination algorithm, some division algorithm. This is usually how it goes when you wanna prove some form of notarianity in some polynomial rings, okay? So I'll also state this division algorithm for certain families of Poisson algebras, okay? Okay, those are the goals. Um, the convention is that for me, K is a field of characteristics zero uh, throughout. Okay, okay, that's it. So let's go just get on with it. Okay, so definitions, cause uh, you know, maybe not everyone in the audience uh, have seen this or, or you know, remembers this. Is that of a Poisson algebra. A Poisson algebra is just, you take this field K, you take a commutative K algebra A, Okay, and this k-algebra comes equipped with a skew-symmetric k-bilinear form, right? It's map, it goes from A to A, so A cross A to A. Satisfies the Jacobi identity, which don't worry about it if you don't, don't remember what it is, it's not very relevant today, some identity. And for us, one of the main properties of this bracket is that if I fix an entry, if I fix an entry, I actually get uh, derivations, okay? Whenever I fix one of the entries, I actually get a derivation, okay? That's, that's it, that's, that's what a Poisson algebra is, okay? Now, how to build Poisson algebras? Well, there's a very canonical and natural way of building Poisson algebras from Lie algebras, which is a classical object in mathematics. So just to remind you again that a Lie algebra is, is, a, is a K vector space that comes equipped with a Lie bracket, okay? This Lie bracket. And what's a Lie bracket? Well, it's just a skew symmetric by linear form satisfying Jacobi, right? So just, just to really stress out the fact that a Lie algebra is just a vector space equipped with this uh, bilinear form, okay? There's no, there's, no, there's no ring structure, right? It's just a vector space. Okay, but now given any such Lie algebra G, we can extend this Lie bracket to, to now an, a, a, an actual algebra, the symmetric algebra, right? Now this symmetric algebra is now a ring, it's also a K algebra, and we can extend the Lie bracket to a Poisson bracket, to a Poisson bracket in the symmetric algebra. How do you do it? You do it in the only possible natural way you can do it that extends the given Lie bracket. So for example, uh, suppose that I take a linear basis. I take a linear basis M of my Lie algebra Okay, it's a vector space, so let's take a basis. Then this symmetric algebra is nothing more than the polynomial ring over K where the variables are just the elements in the basis. 
that's it. It's, it's nothing, nothing fancy or elaborate. It's literally just a polynomial ring where the variables are the elements in the basis. Okay. And now, how do I extend the Lie bracket to a Poisson bracket? Well, the only way you can do it is satisfying the Leibniz rule on each entry. So, for example, if you take three elements in the basis, right, M1, M2, M3, and you wonder, oh, how can I define the Poisson bracket on, on this M1, comma, the product of M2 and M3? Well, it has to satisfy the Leibniz rule on the second entry. So you do what you have to do. And at the end, you get this. But now this bit, M1, M2, are elements in the basis of the Lie algebra. So the Poisson bracket is just going to extend the Lie bracket. And the same thing on the other side. So just following your nose, following that it has satisfied the Leibniz rule, it's a unique way of extending the Lie bracket from the Lie algebra to a Poisson bracket on the symmetric algebra. Omar, okay. can I ask uh, yep. something? Just, uh, I'm sorry, it, 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 do people just speak like this and ask questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's fine. Yes, please do. Okay, oh, I, ju I just want to make sure we, this is really like, this is the commutative polynomial ring, huh? the symmetric algebra is just the- That's right, it's the commutative polynomial ring in these variables, capital M. Thanks. Yeah, no, thanks for the question. It's good to clarify. It's good to clarify that actually throughout my talk, all the algebras and rings appearing are in fact commutative. Okay, all of them. Okay, um, good. Any other questions before I move on? Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so now what is the motivating question here is, you know, kind of a general open-ended question. Uh, for which the algebras does this Poisson algebra, this symmetric algebra, have the ascending chain condition on radical Poisson ideals? Just, that's it, this is, this is a question, right? When do we get some form of Poisson notarianity uh -huh. For which Lie algebra do we get some form of Poisson notarianity, right? And I'm just going to underline here the radical. Okay. Now, of course, you need some assumptions, okay? <laughs> you, you need some assumptions. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. You're not going to get uh, the ACC in an arbitrary symmetric algebra. So one of the first assumptions you have to make is follows from this lemma that if you have the ACC on radical Poisson ideals on the symmetric algebra, then the given Lie algebra, it had to be Lie Noetherian. Lie Noetherian is a natural thing, right? It means that uh, th there is the ACC on Lie ideals. That's what Lie Noetherian means, ACC on Lie ideals. So this is the very, you know, the, 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 the least assumption you have to make on the Lie algebra to get some form of ACC on the symmetric algebra, okay? Okay, however, this is, it, it, it is not enough. This is not enough by the next comment. There are examples of finite generated Lie algebra. Sorry, I, what did I say here is not enough. Uh, oh, I'm not sorry. It's, it's a bit disconnected from the lemma. It's a remark that is slightly disconnected from the lemma. There are examples of finite generated Lie algebras that are not Linotherian. One example is just a free algebra and two generators. So just because you are a Lie algebra that is finitely generated as a Lie algebra, it doesn't give you linear theory. So, okay. So one has to be careful that uh, just because your Lie algebra is finitely generated, that's not enough to get the ACC. Okay. Uh, Oma. Yes. Um, finally generated here means as algebra, right? Not as a Lie as, as a Lie algebra. Right. As a Lie algebra. Right, the algebra, okay. Yes, in, in fact, something I should point out here is that all the algebras that I'm interested in here, all the algebras, right? Uh, all the Lie algebras, all the Lie algebras are infinite dimensional as vector spaces, okay? When the Lie algebra is finite dimensional, then there is nothing to do <laughs> because then the, the, then the symmetric algebra is a polynomial ring in finitely many variables. And then it's just outright, Fully in Ethereum. So the, the, the cases that I'm, we're considering here is when the Lie algebra is of infinite dimension, okay? But you can, you know, you have such Lie algebras that are finitely generated as Lie algebras, as Lie algebra. But in any case, finite generation of Lie algebra is not enough 
okay? And I, I really want to point out that if you remember the differential basis theorem, if you have a differential algebra, which is finitely generated as a differential algebra, then you do have the, 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 the ACC on different radical differential ideals, okay? So this is where this thing sort of the part, the Poisson case with the differential case, okay? Omar, uh, yes. so does, um, do, yeah, that th what you just mentioned, I mean, I think most people are probably familiar with that um, no theoryanity of the differential um, radical ideals. Um, I, I forget, does, is that require some assumption about like the derivatives commuting with each other or not at right. all? So in this case, I am, yes, sorry, I forgot to mention this. When I say differential basis theorem, I do mean differential algebras with commuting derivations. So, so um, a follow-up question. So does the derivations uh, induced by the uh, bracket uh -huh. um, commute? Uh, not necessarily. Okay. That's right. So this is another point where everything kind of diverges, right? Okay. And yeah, so, I mean, I was going to ask something similar to William, which is if you do make, you know, whatever is the proper analog, which I guess I'm not sure of, of, um, you know, the assumption that, that the derivations induced by these Lie brackets commute with each other, then is there a similar result that, that the, that the ACC holds on? Well, there's the other problem that the differential basis theorem is for finitely many derivations that commute, right? Yeah. So even if you ask the derivations to commute in the Poisson context, right? Okay. Uh, it, 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 because these things are finitely generated as Poisson algebras, you might get infinitely many derivations, right? So uh, in the case that you get finitely many derivations and then commute, then maybe I guess it works. <laughs> Okay, uh, okay, all right, anyway. Anyways. That way. Yeah, but no, definitely, I mean, this, your question really points out or stresses out the fact that uh, you need some assumptions in the Lie algebra. If you take the, if you take sort of the free object, this free Lie algebra, then it's just not gonna work. But you need some assumptions to make it slightly tame in some sense on the Lie algebra, okay? So yeah, but maybe maybe some assumptions of the, the ones you're saying, like finitely many committed derivations, I think that might work. Um, okay. But the approach we take is slightly different. Um, right. So so the differential basis theorem is not a special case, right? Of whatever you no, 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 definitely not. Definitely not. <laughs> okay. not a special case. Uh, uh, yeah, just to say again, for me, differential basis theorem means differential algebras in finitely many committing derivations, okay? I, I will say this again later. Okay, now here's a general question that goes a little bit outside, a little bit outside of the scope, but I just wanna bring it in. So another general question is kind of a dual, dual to the symmetric algebra is for which Lie algebras is the universal enveloping algebra two-sided Noetherian? Okay, actually now this is the first place where I'm, before I said my algebras were all commutative. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> this is definitely, the, I think it's the only place where this, this algebra is not commutative. I think this is the only place. In any case, it goes a little outside the scope of the talk, but it's, it's, it's a dual question, okay, to the symmetric algebra stuff. Now, why do I bring this in? Why do I bring this uh, enveloping algebra of the Lie algebra and being two-sided in the theory? And it's because the, the, the reason I started looking into these things was because there was this recent paper for, from about maybe three years ago by uh, Petukov, Alexei Petukov and, and Sue Sierra. And they studied the case of a very special Lie algebra. It's called the positive bit algebra. What is this bit algebra? It's very simple. It's just as a vector space is generated, spanned by E1, E2, E3, E4, and so on. And the Lie bracket, it's as simple as this. That's the Lie bracket, okay? It's a very, very easy to construct, <coughs> excuse me, Lie algebra. Omar, and then, may, then- May I clarify? Yes. Uh, so, so may I ask, so just uh, check that I understand, but is this algebra isomorphic to algebra of uh, differential operators in one variable? Not this one, but one very close to this one. The one that is isomorphic to the one you're saying it starts in negative one. <laughs> ah, so ah, 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 okay. So it, it's a shift. Okay, okay. Thank you for clarifying. Just a shift, yeah, but it's very close to one. It's not, so it's not isomorphic, 
but uh, it's very close. I will talk about that one in a second, actually. Mm -hmm. okay, um, thank you. Right. Uh, and then for this positive beta algebra, they make some partial progress uh, towards this by first proving that the symmetric algebra had ACC on radical Poisson ideals. And if you look at their argument, their arguments are very similar to the standard argument for the differential basis theorem in one derivation. Like if you look at it and you've seen the differential basis theorem, you, re you realize, oh, these this, this are just kind of like adaptations, right? Anyways, so after I saw that, I, I, I spoke to, to Alexei a bit, and then this led to conversations with Sue about the possibility of exploiting the general argument for differential basis theorem in several, finitely many, commuting derivations to establish like some Poisson theoryanity for a more general class rather than just the positive bit algebra, okay? And so the first question she asked me was, oh, how about you think, she asked me, can we adapt the arguments using these differential basis um, ideas to try to prove similar Poisson theoryanity for other Lie algebras or for the symmetric algebra of other Lie algebras? And so there are two basic examples. One of them is the one that Gleb just <laughs> uh, uh, pointed out. The first one is the full bit algebra, which instead of starting at one, you just take all the integers, okay? And the bracket is defined similarly. But this is a different, this is a different uh, non-isomorphic Lie algebra, okay? It's a different non-isomorphic to the, to the previous one, the positive one. And, uh, and the other one is the, the Cartan algebra, which is the one that Gleb pointed out. Uh, is the, is the algebra of, 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 of der derivations in one variable. And it starts at negative one, okay? And she asked me whether the symmetric algebra of either of these two examples have ACC and radical Poisson ideals, okay? The arguments they had for the positive bit algebra just didn't work. One needed to generalize things. And so we, we thought, like, okay, can we use the differential basis theorem for this or the arguments in there? Okay, so that's how it all started. Okay, are there any questions? Or I move on. Okay, so that's how we this is how we, how it all started. And so I just want to give a very quick reminder of what are the two main ingredients in the differential basis theorem. Okay, if you've seen the differential basis theorem. This is really just a reminder, okay? Uh, so recall that if I have a differential field in finitely many commuting derivations, the differential polynomial ring over K in N variables, right? Satisfies the ACC and radical differential ideals, right? Um, the well-known theorem and differential algebra. Now the, the proof uses theory of uh, conservative ideals, which I don't wanna talk about really, but the two main ingredients are the following two things. The first one is that if you look at the vector space spanned by the formal derivatives, right? These, these, are, these are the formal derivatives, right? This is what we call the, the formal, formal derivatives. And then I just take the linear combinations of those over K, right? The, the vector space spanned by the formal derivatives of my variable, then this vector space is, is n graded. It's differential. It's, it's differential, differential n graded vector space. And it is differential in Ethereum. Okay? And that just means that it has the ACC on differential subspaces. Okay? Now, why? Why is it, why is it differential? What, what is it differential in Ethereum? What's behind the differential Ethereanity of this vector space? Well, if you've seen this, it's just Dixon's lemma. It's really just Dixon's lemma behind it, right? Okay, so that, that's one thing. That's kind of one ingredient. Dixon's lemma behind the differential notoriality of this differential vector space B. Now, before I talk about ingredient two, I think it's worth pointing out that the, the, the differential polynomial ring in N variables, well, by definition, is this, right? the, the polynomial ring in all the formal derivatives. Therefore, it's just the polynomial ring, right? Of, of generated where the bases are precisely the, the, the basis of this vector space B, 
right? Just the polynomial ring where the variables are these bases of the vector space V, which is really just the symmetric algebra, right? So the differential polynomial ring, you can also think about it as the, symmet the, the differential algebra uh, with underlying algebra, just the symmetric algebra of this vector space V, okay? And the derivation extends the derivation in V, okay? All right, now, Moving on to the second ingredient of the differential basis theorem is, as usual, an elim the, the elimination algorithm. Let's use the elimination algorithm, right? Once you have this differential division algorithm, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an easy consequence that every prime differential ideal of the differential polynomial ring looks like this, where this lambda is a, is a finite set, which we know it's the characteristic set, okay? That's the second ingredient, having an elimination algorithm so that every prime differential ideal is almost finitely generated. Okay? Any questions? Okay. Uh, please stop me if there's any questions at some point, okay? So now, um, going back to the Poisson algebras context, um, as I said before, you do need some assumptions on the Lie algebra, right? You need some assumptions on the Lie algebra. And so we're gonna restrict ourselves uh, to, to what is called graded, graded Lie algebras, which I'll explain why it makes sense to restrict to this family of Lie algebras. Okay, what is a graded Lie algebra? So a Lie algebra is said to be set, set graded, Right. If there is a, a decomposition as a vector space, yeah, this is a vector space decomposition, right, in this form, this direct sum, right, but that is compatible with the Lie bracket. This simply means this. Okay. This is what, uh, oh, I'm sorry. And additionally, that each homogeneous component is finite dimensional. These GN, these are called the homogeneous components, okay, of degree N. And, and we assume they're finite dimensional, okay? This is what a Z-graded Lie algebra is. Okay, uh, one property that graded Lie algebras might or might not have is that of being of polynomial growth. So a graded Lie algebra is of polynomial growth if the dimensions of these homogeneous components, it grows polynomially, which is just, it's just this, right? There is some degree such that it's bounded. Okay. Okay. Now to put it in some perspective, comparing it to the differential case, recall that in the, in the differential case, right, where the differential polynomial ring is just the symmetric algebra of this V, of this vector space V, this V, it was N graded, right? So in the previous slide about the Lie algebra, we have this Z graded. In the differential context, we have N graded, right? By order. And, and, and we know that each component is finite dimensional because of each order, there's only finitely many uh, formal derivatives of that order. And we know it grows polynomially. In fact, you know, we have this, you know, we have these polynomials are, the degree of the polynomials are the number of derivations, right? So we know, we actually know a lot more, okay? Okay, um, sorry, I was just, there was something on the chat that I think uh, Gleb already responded. Okay, so now what we expect or what we believe the assumptions on the Lie algebra should be is sort of mimicking these properties of the vector space V. So the conjecture we have so far is that if you assume that you have a Lie algebra, which is Z graded of polynomial growth, then if the, Lie algebra, if the Lie algebra is Linotherian, then the symmetric algebra has ACC on radical Poisson ideas, okay? So this is the conjecture we have so far. It's a still, it's a still open. We don't know the full answer of this, but we were able to prove one case, one, one well, so, some partial results around this, some partial results suggesting that this might, giving evidence that this might be true, okay? 
Now, we do need some form of division algorithm. So we need to sort of talk about this, the division algorithm, right? Um, now, before I, things get technical, as they always do with division algorithms, um, I just wanna give an example to keep in mind. Remember that the full bit algebra, right? The full bit algebra was the Lie algebra with bases given by ENs, where N is an integer, and the bracket was just this. Well, we can put a natural grading on this, where these are the homogeneous components, right? This of polynomial growth. In fact, each component has dimension one, right? Furthermore, we can put a total order on the basis just by saying this. We can just put this total order on the basis. And this is compatible with the grading in the sense that if something is larger in the grading, then it's also larger in the order. Okay, it's compatible with the given grading. Okay. Anyways, so in this example, we, we have a grading and we have a basis, these EIs, and we can put an order on the basis. Okay. And when you do elimination algorithms, you always end up ranking variables. And that's what's going on here. This, this sort of order is like ranking variables. Okay. So if you remember uh, from the differential you know, uh, polynomial ring, we, you, you put some ranking, you know, whatever it means, some, some nice ranking, okay? Okay, so from now on, I'm gonna have a, a Lie algebra, which is uh, graded. I'm not, I'm not going to assume polynomial growth. It's just, just a graded Lie algebra. I'm gonna fix a basis. I'm gonna fix a basis, okay? Which is consistent of homogeneous component elements, and it's equipped with an order compatible with the grading, okay? Uh, this is, if it's the first time you see this, uh, then it might, might take some, some time to digest, but maybe it's a good idea to keep the previous example in mind, or as I was saying, think of this as putting some orderly ranking on variables. Yeah, you, you put in some nice ranking on variables, orderly ranking if you like, right? From, the, from you know referring to the differential polynomial ring, what 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 sorts of things you do, right? Okay, so I'm just ranking my variables. That's what's going on here? Okay, um, so now we have this symmetric algebra with this Poisson bracket, right? And now remember that my symmetric algebra is just polynomials in variables uh, given by the basis. And now. If you remember the differential polynomial ring, uh, once you fix a ranking in the variables, then you can talk about leaders. You talk about leaders and you talk about initials and you talk about separants and you talk about all these things, right? So now what is the analog of that once you have this ranking on the basis? Okay, so it's a natural thing to do. You give me an F, the symmetric algebra. The upper, upper leader, the upper leader, Huh? denoted by this, is the largest element in the basis that appears in F, okay? It's the largest element. Now you might, you might wonder why you're talking about upper, what is this upper? Well, remember that the, the Lie algebra is set graded. It's not, it's not N graded. So you're gonna have elements, uh, you know, positive uh, degree or things also with ne negative degree, right? The homogeneous components can be positive and negative. So, so you might need to talk about positive and negative uh, leaders, okay? Anyways, that's the definition of a positive leader, upper leader. And then once you have this, you can, you know, you can write F in the usual form. So it has some degree in the, in the upper leader and the, and, and, the and, the, and, and the coefficient, the leading coefficient is what we call the initial, the same thing as in differential polynomial rings. And then you have the upper separant which is the formal derivative of F with respect to the upper leader. Okay. Okay, so this is just following kind of modeling after the differential polynomial uh, uh, elimination algorithm. Okay. And now in, similarly, you can talk about the lower leader, you can talk about the lower initial, and you can talk about the lower separant. Just to give an example, Right. Um, suppose that we're back to the case of the full bit algebra, where the basis is just this. Okay. Now, an element in the symmetric algebra is, for example, 
a polynomial in these variables ENs, right? So this is one example. So if I ask you to compute the upper leader, well, you, you realize that the, the, the highest variable appearing is E5. If I ask you to compute the upper initial, well, here is the leading coefficient. And then the upper separand is just a formal derivative with respect to the upper leader. And it's the same thing we do in the differential polynomial ring. Okay. And then similarly, if I ask you to compute the lower leader, lower initial, and lower separand. Okay. Are there any questions? Okay, now here, do I have time to talk about this? Yeah, yeah, I think it's fine. So I think for the next three slides, things are rather technical. So I might, I'm, I, I'm thinking about skipping these ones, but maybe I'll just point out important bits, but this is very technical. So don't worry if these three slides just feel overwhelming. I think after these three, things become conceptually clear. Okay, so I'll just go through these three uh, without reading everything. So, but the point of these three slides is that now that you have the notion of, of leader and, and separant and, and all these things, you can define just as in the differential polynomial ring, the notion of reduced. Right, where you just eliminate some things, eliminate some variables by taking some derivatives. And then you say things are reduced if no proper derivative of this appears in this. It's kind of the same thing. It's a, it's a little bit more subtle than that. So what's going on is that you take a tuple of elements in the basis of say positive degree, and you denote this kind of derivative operator. You define it to be this and then you take upper leader. Now this, this is taking, remember that these brackets, right? It's, it's like taking derivatives. It's like, it's like taking derivatives several times. So I'll just put here, this is like taking derivatives in some sense, okay? Okay. So it's, it's, a, it's kind of analog to differential context, okay? And so what this now, what I want is the collection of formal derivatives well, what, yes, was, what was the subscript I stand for? The subscript I. Uh, e I plus. Yeah, this, right. This I denotes yeah. this particular tuple. I take I take a oh, tuple. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, all right. I okay, missed that. I, missed, I thought there was an index, sorry. Oh yeah, no, no, no. It's just this particular. Okay. For each tuple yes. like that, oh, okay. I can take this derivative. Okay. Now. So, so it's just the leader of a uh, composition of derivations, right? That's right, that's right. You take a bunch of- oh, it's, almost, it's almost like delta one, delta two, delta three. Delta two, that's three. right, that's right, that's right. This is like taking a bunch of derivations delta one and then apply several times, delta two, several times, delta three, several times. But in this case, you have to take the leader of that, but yeah. Right. Okay. And now what you wanna find is all of those, all of those formal derivatives. So this capital L, in a way, they know this, all these formal derivatives, but it's not all of them. And this is a subtlety that, I don't think we have time to talk in detail about this, but you take all those formal derivatives with some property, and this is the property. Uh, anyways, so don't worry too much about this technical property. It's important, but just think that is the, this is a set of formal derivatives of M with some property, okay? <laughs> Not all of them, but almost all of them, okay? Um, okay. And uh, are, you, are you ordering the N and M uh, lexicographically or what? You mean you mean these ends? This this yeah. Uh, yeah yeah yeah. So okay. remember that one of my assumptions, if I can go back a little bit, uh, one of my assumptions is that um, oh sorry, maybe it's too way too back. Um, sorry, why do I have that here? Is that the basis comes with this order? So, so the elements in my basis, these M, M I's and N, all of them, there's, there's this fixed order throughout. So I can, I can definitely compare them. Okay. It's precisely this. So again, this is like in the differential case, when you rank your, your formal derivatives, right? Uh, in an orderly way or any other way, okay? Okay, uh, now the definition of reduced 
It's just what you would expect. If I take two elements, then G is partially reduced with respect to F if no element here, remember this is like formal derivatives of F, a bit sort of more subtle, but you should think of this as formal derivatives of, of, of the leader of F. And I'm saying that none of these appear in G, like a differential context, but a bit more subtle. And then you say that it's fully reduced if, if the leader appears, but with degree less than the degree in F. Again, exactly like in the differential context. Well, almost exactly. And then finally, if I have a sequence, a sequence, then I say that the sequence is partially reduced or reduced if Fj is reduced with respect to Fi, where the i is less than G, J, okay? Now I'm thinking of them as, it's a bit, it's a slightly different in the differential context. I'm thinking of them as sequences. And I'm saying that this one is reduced with respect to the previous ones. But it's almost the same as in the differential context. So I don't want to spend too much time on this. Okay, and then the division algorithm, it's rather technical, but if you've seen the division algorithm for the differential context, it's exactly what you expect. That if you take a finite sequence, and then some element, then there exists something that is partially reduced with respect to the sequence, satisfying the usual congruence, which is the same thing happens in the differential context. So I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's technical, but it should really remind you of differential uh, division algorithm, okay? And then if the sequence is reduced, then I can actually find something that is not only partially reduced, but it's fully reduced. And the same congruence expected works. Uh, noting that, of course, now you need initials, right? For, so this is the same in the differential context. The differential context for partial reducedness, you only need separance. And for fully reducedness, you need separance and initials. It's the same thing, okay? So there, there is a division algorithm, right? Under the right assumptions. And it works very similarly to the differential one. Okay, now I think I don't have time to talk about this. So here's my definition of one of the algebra is Dixonian. I'm gonna skip this. I'm gonna skip this slide. I don't think I have time to talk about this slide. It's very technical, but it's a, it's a, it's a definition of a, of a Lie algebra being Dixonian. And I'm just gonna do this. A Lie algebra is Dixonian if there is no infinite, Dixonian sequence, but the definition of Dixonian sequence is a bit technical, okay? But it's the natural thing to do in a way, okay? Okay, but now why, why is this nice or important? If you, have a, if you have a Dixonian Lie algebra, then reduced sequences are finite. Reduced sequences are finite, okay? And, uh, in the, and just to remember, to remind you, in the differential context, auto-reduced sets are automatically finite by Dixon's lemma. There's nothing to do there. It's just auto-reduced sets in the differential polynomial rings are automatically finite by Dixon's lemma. In this case, this is not generally the case, but we have this notion of being a Dixonian Lie algebra, which implies this finiteness, okay? Okay, now once you have this, then you apply the same ideas as in the differential context, differential arguments that if you have a Dixonian Lie algebra, then every prime Poisson ideal looks like this. Okay. Oh, by the way, yeah, okay, that's fine. And as a consequence, you get that the symmetric algebra has ACC on radical Poisson ideals. So the, the assumption on this theorem is this Dixonian Lie algebra, right? If the Lie algebra is Dixonian, then the symmetric algebra satisfies the ACC on radical Poisson ideals. Okay. Um, uh, Gleb, uh, do I have a minute or should I stop here? I'm... Or uh, Ron, ah, I'll take I'll take up your minute. Ronnie is uh, saying something, but he's muted. Yes, yeah. Sorry, I was saying something. Um, I think um, we could stop here for for a moment. Yeah, sure. um, I think it's a good time. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll reconvene and we can talk more about technical stuff or you can add more things. 
Sure, that's fine. Sure. Yeah, I think I have maybe three slides left, so I'm happy to talk about yeah. afterwards if people right. want to can go to those three slides. I think so. Okay, so let's let us thank uh, Omar for the first part. So, okay. do we have any uh, quick questions that we want to ask Omar at this point? Yeah, I said I said I want to take up that minute. Um, <laughs> so you de you defined um, these. De uh, capital D sub I something, all right? Yep. Uh, using the uh, the right hand argument of the bracket. That's what right. if you do it with the left hand one? Okay, so remember that my brackets are Lie brackets, so there is Q symmetric. So right. if, ah, if I put okay. it on the other side, oh, it's just a negative the sign. They should give you the same thing, you're saying? Yeah, oh, it's just okay. a negative sign in front. So, so it's just a negative sign. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's why. That's why. That's why here you go, you can only deal with the with one of the entries, one of the the right hand side. Yeah. So presumably, then you can also mix them. Left uh, and right in in some any number of combinatorial ways. Yeah. So you can mix them up exactly. You can mix them up, but at the, at because the they all just change by a sign in some sense, right? Is that correct? That, because the only because you only change by a sign, then you can just do one side really. But you okay. can do it in, so for instance, if you take the Poisson idea generated, well, you, ha you have to take both sides. You have to start taking things on both sides, but at the right. end, because of the skew symmetry, you only have to do it on one side. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have a question too. Um, the uh, G acts on itself by the adjoint action, correct? So that doesn't that make G also act on the symmetric algebra? So can you say that again? G, G acts on itself by, oh, yeah, yeah. by the adjoint action. So then it also acts on the symmetric algebra. Yeah. So yes, uh, yeah, because you know, I mean, those are just tensor yeah. powers of the adjoint representation. So my question is, um, are the Poisson ideals of the symmetric algebra the same as the G ideals, where we're thinking of G acting by the adjoint action. Yeah, 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 I know what you mean. Um, yes, 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 that's that's true. Yes, yes, they are, they are. Yeah, they are again, because it just follows because this, uh, this Poisson bracket is just uh, a derivation in both entries, right? So if you if you apply a, a bracket with an element in the symmetric algebra using the Leibniz rule, at the end it, at the end it does reduce to applying just elements in the basis. So elements right. in the Lie algebra. Yeah. Good. Um, thank you. Okay. So so after you have this this uh, ACC theorem, uh, right. is there any way then to tell when a Poisson ideal is prime? Or, or is there any prime decomposition of? Uh, yes. Oh, yes, yes, that's right. So yeah, so there is, there is. Uh, so those so, should be corollaries, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So it's a corollary. Once you have these sort of things, then you have this, you know, every, exactly what you're saying. You have this finite decomposition of prime, of, 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 of any radical Poisson ideal into finitely many prime Poisson right. ideals. Yeah, and the, but this, this, this corollary is just a general result about this conservative ideal business. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, you do get nice consequences once you have the, the Poisson of the reality. Yeah. Do you have any test for Dixomnia sequence? Any test? Yes, we, any have, test? We, actually, we, have a, we have one test to check for Dixonianity, but the test we have so far we feel is rather restricted because we uh, it, it's give it's, it's it's in a form that it really depends on how the basis of the Lie algebra looks like and and you know that you can actually see how the bracket of two bases behaves nicely as a combination. Actually, I think the way we have it is under the assumption that the bracket of two basis elements is a scalar of a basis element. <laughs> so it's, 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 <laughs> we want to test. But it's a bit restricted, so it's not it's not okay. a great test. However, uh, this test applies to at least three examples that we had in mind. So it wasn't it wasn't useless test, <laughs> but 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 it's not that it's not that uh, general. Yes. 
Okay, so um, I think um, let us stop uh, for a second. Let's go to the breakout rooms and then we'll come back. We can ask more questions and um, see more of his of Omar's slides. All right. I'm going to stop recording.